On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today we will visit some places where people haven't had it easy. Despite the hardships they experience daily, they choose to stay and shape their destiny. Bamiyan, a poverty-stricken Afghan province mercilessly tested by time. Nide, a Turkish province with striking history. And Patagonia, the rough land at the very end of the world. On the day when every soul will be brought face to face with the good that it has done and with the evil it has done, it will wish there were a great distance between itself and its evil. Bamiyan, the biggest territory of the ancient Hazarajat. It's an inhospitable land surrounded by the vast Afghan mountains. So frigid are these places that it would burn and scorch and torture a person just as the severest fire would, and worse. Since ancient times, people have lived scattered in majestic solitude with only the silent elements as their witness in this beautiful, moonlike landscape. Human destiny seems almost futile on the foothills of the Hindu Kush. It's as if its duration is not much longer than the sound of footsteps on a dusty road. Their echo is quickly lost within these silent mountains. The whimsical cold wind continuously shapes the landscape into new shapes and chisels abstract sculptures out of the rocks. It causes man to get the shivers. Believe it or not, even this barren place can be fought over. Each step is potentially dangerous. Whoever wanders off the path is playing Russian roulette. Treacherous mines are buried all over the place, a sad reminder of the fight against the Taliban. Before winter sets in, with the soil cracked and parched in the distance, like a desert mirage, life-giving water murmurs. It is the waterfall on the river Bande Amir. Even at the height of summer, the water temperature is only two degrees Celsius. Icy winds and the freezing water flow result in stalactites growing in all directions. The six lakes on the river Bande Amir create an 11 kilometer long cascade. This is the work of nature. Water from melting snow permeates the surrounding limestone and dissolves the minerals. For this reason, the lake contains a mild calcium carbonate solution which reacts with the water plants. The chemical reaction leads to the formation of travertine, resulting in color effects on the water surface. Each of the lakes ends in a natural dam overgrown with moss, over which the water flows toward the next lake. The current is at its strongest just below such a dam, and so can easily propel even a plunge mill. Where ye are, death will find you, even if ye are in towers built up strong and tall. The Hazara people, one of the main Afghan ethnic groups, have been persecuted since the days of King Abdurrahman Khan, 
who exterminated two-thirds of these people. Those who survived either fled to Iran and Pakistan or hid in the mountains here in Bamiyan. In the 90s, they fell into disfavor once again with the ruling Sunni Taliban. The Hazara people are in fact followers of the Shiite branch of Islam. Dawn is breaking over Bamiyan, the province's capital. People rush to work and do other obligations through the early morning mist. The rusting tanks, mementos of the Soviet military occupation of Afghanistan, no longer evoke any emotion. A veil of deep despair hangs above the waking town. The standard of living in Bamiyan is very poor. The Soviet occupation, the brutal Taliban government, the drought that is destroying agriculture, all these factors continuously disrupt the already shaky economy. As such, the basic goal of all efforts is to have at least enough food to feed the family. As simple as that may seem, here it's often an impossible proposition. Many people still live in caves on the rocky hillsides and feed on bran. The local cave system has, like the entire country, a long and troubled history. Children. Despite their unfortunate fate, they amuse themselves just like their kind anywhere else in the world. Perhaps they have a better future in store for them. Let's hope so. The cave system in the cliffs above the city was carved in the 5th century AD, while King Kanishka ruled beneath the Hindu Kush. One of the many roads the Silk Route consisted of led through this valley from the far east. Even earlier, two giant statues of Buddha were carved in the rock by order of the king. The little Buddha measures 35 meters and the big Buddha 53 meters. Work on the two statues took the better part of 100 years, which adorned this place for the following 15 centuries. The narrow-minded interpretation of a part of the Quran, however, claims that it's inappropriate for man to depict faces. In 2001, backed up by this argument, the members of the Taliban carried out something that the world found difficult to comprehend. The statues were blasted away by these fanatics. A similar bitter fate also awaited so many beautiful and rare paintings. What wasn't destroyed during the plundering raids of Genghis Khan, what made it through countless wars and the Russian invasion, fell on the altar of fanatical beliefs. This damage is immense and irrevocable. It's hard to say what the result of efforts by local and international organizations to restore the monument will be. to see, the capital no longer in sight, not Europe, not really Asia. A forgotten region of farmers and amicable villagers. Also, the potato storehouse of Turkey. This is the province of Nide. The Ilari Ravine winds like a 16 kilometer long incision through the surrounding countryside. A vast grove of poplars reaches to the sky like green arrows. A pleasant and moist microclimate exists here. It's this very microclimate that attracted people even in the times of ancient Rome. The gorge boasts a number of very unique curiosities. The weeping trees, 
Willows in particular are one source of them. They produce so much sap that it seems to drip out spontaneously. Nide, just like the Bamiyan province, is seemingly bored completely through by artificial caves. Here, however, there are increasingly more deserted rock monasteries and churches on top of it. The Byzantine monastery of Eski Gemusler, which stands for made of silver, is impressive. It's set in a 15 meter deep square shaft. It conceals a number of fascinating murals, which unfortunately have been damaged by the relentless flow of time and possibly vandals. In addition, it boasts a perfectly preserved three-nave church depicting the Virgin Mary with the baby Jesus. The unknown artist conjured up a mysterious smile like that of Mona Lisa on Mary's face. One may only wonder what she is smiling about. In the eastern corner of the Alari Ravine lies the parish of Selim that abounds in strange rock structures and stone pyramids that are inaccurately referred to as magic chimneys for lack of a better name. They also resemble hoods if viewed from the right angle. Don't you think so? Briquettes are dried below one such hood. They are 100% natural, we shall say. In Turkish, they are called Turkish tezek, which more or less corresponds to the English word turdy. It is made by forming dung and straw, using a circular mold and leaving it to dry in the sun. It's dried on stones, walls, roofs, anywhere really. A few weeks later, the briquettes are a ready-made fuel. They're used in stoves as well as ovens because there's no coal in the region. Today, as in Roman times, water is a strategically important resource in this region. A very long ancient aqueduct wound its way from the artificial reservoir all the way to Tiana, which today is a suburb of the city of Bor. It bears the same name as the province. This is the impressive mountain range of Aladaglar in all its splendor. In its foothills, lies the village of Badamdere, known for its fruit orchards and beekeeping. Several icy streams flow from the mountains, ensuring that the foothills are very well irrigated. Thus, literally anything can grow here. Plums, cherries, pears, apples, anything. The rough terrain below the Tsukurbag mountain is a temporary home to nomadic shepherds. The herdsmen spend their nights on the pastures while their wives and children sleep in makeshift camps. It's only a temporary arrangement, but it's well equipped. The shepherds and their families are just one part of this beautiful and historic place from which we must now say goodbye.
From Turkey, we moved to a place known as the end of the world. And no wonder, Patagonia, a virgin land at the very tip of the South American continent, consists predominantly of seemingly infinite distances over which beautiful flocks of flamingos soar. It lies in both flat Argentina and partially in mountainous Chile. Despite its overall remoteness, people have found their way here and managed to become naturally integrated into this inhospitable landscape. The people achieve this by learning to employ the ever-present forces of nature, such as the speed of wind, which sometimes blows 120 kilometers per hour. This country at the foothills of the Andes, at the very end of the immense plain, is inhabited by descendants of early immigrants who live in the Pampas, just like their grandfathers once did. The horse has always been the only means of transportation on the Pampas. Esteban Echevarria, a descendant of a Basque immigrant family, breeds magnificent thoroughbred horses of the Argentine Criollo breed. He owns dozens of them, and surprisingly, complains of a lack of space. Apparently, he only inherited a mere 2,000 hectares from his ancestors. This is something difficult to imagine people elsewhere lamenting. Near the foot of the huge Cerro Buenos Aires is a forest which is part of the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve since 1978. People in Patagonia fortunately understand that such great natural treasures must be protected. The famous Chilean poet and writer Pablo Neruda wrote, whoever has not seen the Patagonian forest does not know this planet. He was right. The atmosphere of the forest is truly unforgettable. Mainly the long-lived Nothophagus, a distant relative of the beech tree, grows in this forest. Indians used its bark to manufacture their canoes. Their trunks are covered in hanging mosses and beard grass, while down in the thicket of cranberries, life pulsates. This lovely area on the Argentine-Chilean border is called Calafate. The name apparently comes from these pink berries. The local people believe that whoever have some are sure to return here. In Patagonia, you are bound to encounter cowboys, but beware, here they are known as gauchos. This is Facundo, who looks after 400 head of cattle. All he needs are two horses and 10 dogs as helpers. These, on the other hand, are ovejeros, or shepherds. Wearing stylish leather doublets and red berets, they care for a herd of 2,000.
The Strait of Magellan, at the southernmost tip of South America, connects the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean and separates the mainland of South America from Tierra del Fuego. The shores are dotted with shipwrecks that have fallen victim to the treacherous weather conditions. The strait was named after the Portuguese explorer, Ferdinand Magellan, who, in the service of the King of Spain, was the first man to ever sail through this strait during his round-the-world voyage in 1520. The Torres del Paine National Park is a beautiful piece of nature whose perfection was affected by man. A few years ago, much of the forest was destroyed by a catastrophic fire caused by a careless tourist. And so the original Patagonian forest will never again grow on the slopes near the Lake Amarga. Despite the tragedy, the park still has incredibly beautiful scenery to offer. An example is the Rainbow Waterfall, Salto Grande, near the Lake Nordenskjold. This area is the home to the Guanaco Llamas. The arrival of Spaniards who brought the disease mange with them from Europe was a great blow to the local llama population. The Guanaco Llamas fortunately survived, and so we may still admire their romantic courtship dance today. They are also remarkably unafraid of humans, and so spit happily at passers-by. Perhaps they're paying back for what man has done to them and to Patagonia's nature as a whole. Encountering a wild South American ostrich, Darwin's Rio or Nandu, is nothing out of the ordinary here. These graceful sprinters cannot fly, but they can run really well. Really, really well. We now part with this harsh yet beautiful end of the world, wishing that its people, as well as its animals, farewell. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we'll travel all the way to Thailand and Sri Lanka. In Buddhist Thailand, we'll find out a thing or two about local culture, followed by a trip to the magical and famous island of Phuket. Some 30 kilometers south of India lies an island that has been known by many names throughout history. The Indian elephant lives in Sri Lanka. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us.